How about a round of applause for the people responsible for these videos? They're amazing. So I want to start off by saying I am not Lise Doucette, and I apologize for that. I wish I was. Lise is stuck in London and wasn't able to join, so I have been pressed into service to take over. My name's Tom Clark. For those of you who have been at the forum before, you may remember, I usually turn this into a TV show. Well, we're not doing a TV show today, so we're not going to pause for commercials as we used to do. That was always the fun part. Um, but we have made it to the end of the forum. This is the last session, and in many ways, probably one of the most important ones, and I think you'd all agree, that when you're taking a look at questions of national security and how the United States, for example, has seen climate change as a threat to national security, it really affects and informs almost everything we do. And so we've got a terrific panel here uh, to talk about the challenges of the process of how governments, societies deal with the overwhelming issues of how we deal with climate change. And I briefly want to introduce you to all of them. First of all, to my uh, right here is, uh, sorry, if you remember a few years ago, I didn't need glasses. Now I need glasses. <laughs> It has nothing to do with climate change, but there you go. <laughs> Nicolas Tenzer, he is the director of Le Banquet, which is an academic journal uh, from Paris, but it is in English. You can find it online, a superb publication. He has also been, for many years, advisors, an advisor to the French government, to the French prime minister, on a whole range of governance issues. And he's from France. Welcome. We have here from Georgetown, Texas. This is going to be really quite interesting. The mayor, Dale Ross, who is now a bit of a movie star. Not a bit of a movie star. He's a huge movie star. He's just done a film with Robert Redford's son. He's hanging out with Al Gore. And he's also a conservative Republican from Texas. Go figure. Anyway, Mr. Mayor, good to have you here. And all the way from Tokyo, uh, we're joined by Masashi Nishihara, who is the uh, director of the, uh, I want to get this right, the president of the Research Institute for Peace and Security. Again, dealing with this whole question of security and how climate change fits into that. And then finally, a man who actually, when I introduce you, Carl, it's easier to say what you haven't done in your life, because that's a much shorter list than what you have done. The former prime minister of Sweden, the foreign foreign minister of Sweden, one of the most effective and respected foreign ministers in the European Union over the years and in the international community doing work for the United Nations. And Mr. Bill, it's always terrific to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm going to start off, and I, okay, I got to start off with Dale. Mr. Mayor. Dale's fine. Okay. Georgetown, Texas. Now, let me get this straight. You are a conservative Republican. Right wing. Right wing conservative Republican. <laughs> in a state whose wealth was built with oil, and your town runs on 100% renewable energy. And in the last election, you got 72% of the vote. All true. Uh, OK, I don't understand any of that. Well, during the day, I'm a CPA. It would be very similar to a chartered accountant in Canada and London. And so in Georgetown, we make decisions based on the facts. And this was an economic decision, and I'll show you how it works. In 2008, we were charging 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour to our customers. Today, we're charging 9.2 cents. Okay, so that's a 24% decrease in the cost of electricity to you if you live in the great city of Georgetown. So. If you win the economic argument by default, you win the environmental argument. And that's what we've done. We do what makes sense for the people that we were elected to serve. And the incredible thing about that is that you somehow managed to depoliticize the entire issue of climate change. Well, we're still working on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you did, but not everybody yeah. else is on well, board. Well, it is. Right. Why don't we just do what's the best for, best for, in my case, I represent the citizens of Georgetown, and at the end of the day, it all works out if you do what's right and what's best. And right now, renewable energy is the best thing out there compared to fossil fuels for the city of Georgetown. And I'm going to, later on, I'll give you my worldview on that, too. Well, we, we look forward to that. Um, Dr. Nishihara, I, I wanted to ask, 
coming out of what Dale's experience has been in Georgetown, he makes the argument that it is an economic advantage to go down that road. In the studies that you do for peace and security, uh, what are the consequences otherwise? I mean, I can see the positives of making the economic argument, but from where you sit, what are the negatives? In other words, should we be looking at this, as does the U.S. military, in national security terms? Well, the, the, uh, this uh, uh, issue of environmental question not only affects the military services people, but also it does affect the general living in, in, in Japan or in other parts of the world. Uh, so we have to pay attention to what is being done by this uh, uh, COP23, uh, for example, uh, which was just uh, concluded in Bonn. And this has uh, very important implications for what the countries should do in this area. And, and, and I might suggest maybe that while COP22 and COP23 are extremely important, maybe we should be studying Georgetown a little bit too. Because, and Nicola, this is where I want to come to, and Carl, I, I, I want to ask you the same question. It's more a political one. Because, and it's how states react and how politics. Uh, can be, in a sense, weaponized on, on this issue. It's not easy. You've advised the French government on a number of issues, but what about the process? I mean, when you t when, I mean, can we hold Georgetown up as saying, look, it actually works. There's no barriers to doing this. You know, I, I think there are different things. There are, first of all, I think there is a political issue, which is the political issue is that climate change is not only about climate change. It's about fighting all bad behaviors, mindset which are not appropriate, about egoism, and making, I think, the choices more collective and far-reaching with a long-term perspective. I think that's not only changing the, 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 the way the politicians are thinking, or the scientists, or the policymakers, but also each citizen. But in order to do so, I think that we must have, and I think that's what, what you were saying just at the moment, we must have positive examples coming from the field. And we have a lot of examples. We had a lot of good practices to share. And also, I think that's one of the goals of COP23, which was just COP23, but then uh, COP24, and all the process around that, is to share the good examples that could convince the people that's not only is, I will say, morally good, it's scientifically sustainable, it's uh, politically right, but also that it's economically relevant. And that at the end of the day, not only the next generation or children, grandchildren, will benefit the fight against climate change, but that we, right now, we will also benefit from the climate change. And I think that's a very interesting process. But having seen that, I think we must be also aware that we have also to come to some other forces. And I think the, that what I was saying is also the fight against climate change is not about fight against climate change. It's also fight against fakes, about what we call post-truth politics. It's also the fight for science. It's the fight also for multilateralism. And if we see that some states are trying right now to undermine this fight, I think that could have also consequences on all the security processes on the world stage. And that's also another issue that we have to raise. But the citizens right now are not this understanding. They must, first of all, they must be very convinced that there is something that we have and that they have themselves. Each of us, they have to do right now. Carl, picking up on this, uh, there's very few people who have had more experience than you in dealing with multilateral situations. And in fact, when you were active in your home country of Sweden, you were banging the drum on environment before a lot of other people were. So let's recognize that. But at the same time that we've got Dale running his city on 100% renewable, which is an extraordinary accomplishment, we have in China a coal plant opening almost every single day, despite the, the intention of the Chinese government to, to pull back. My numbers may be a little bit out of date, yeah, but there's a lot yeah. of them, yeah. and there's more coming on stream all the time. What are the complications 
of going from the one example in Georgetown, Texas, to making that acceptable to a wide and diverse audience of competing ideas, competing ideologies, and competing national interests? Well, we have, we have, of course, if we talk about Texas or Sweden or Canada, whatever, I mean, we have things to do and we can do them and we should do them. Uh, the developed economies with fairly high levels of technology. But the big, the big, big, big change is really, as you indicate, that's really India, it's China, further down the road, Africa. If you look at the figures, some of the latest figures that are out, by 2040, world energy demand is going to be up 30%. That is India and that is China. India needs to add an energy infrastructure equivalent to what we have in the entire European Union by today, by 2040. China needs to add an energy infrastructure equal to what the United States has by 2040. And they need to do this with technologies that are emitting significantly less than what is done today. Is this doable? I think it's probably doable, but I say probably. Because I, I listen to some people who say, well, the technologies will develop, particularly solar and things like that. They're coming down in price very fast and other technology is doable. While I listen to others who say it requires some sort of technological breakthrough uh, to make it possible. So there's politics here, of course. The Indians and the Chinese are saying, you've been developing for years. Now it's our turn. So we need to sort that out by sort of transfer of resources uh, to help them. There's the technological issues that are there. And then, of course, the awareness that if we fail, and at the moment, we are on the course to failure. I mean, the present trends, as was indicated with COP23, is that we're heading for an increase in temperature by 3, 3.5%. That might be not a catastrophe in Ottawa or Stockholm in November. Uh, but in the Arctic and in Africa, if I see it from a European perspective, looking up north, what's going to happen there, where climate change is happening twice as fast as everywhere else? Or if I'm looking down to Africa, what's going to happen there? I mean, Africa, to look at the figures there, just on population, mid-1990s, population in the European Union and all of Africa was roughly the same. By 2050, only Nigeria will be bigger than the European Union. And towards the end of the century, 40% of all of the working age population of the world will be in Africa. So if we have sort of climate stress happening there, in the most sort of rapidly expanding part of the world, security implications are going to be vast. So we need to succeed by the example of what we do, Georgetown, Sweden, Canada, in India, and in China in order to avoid real problems further down the road. Yeah. And doctor, I, I don't want to put you in the position of answering for the Japanese government. <laughs> Let me make that clear. But you're from Japan. Uh, so <laughs> when, we're looking, when we're looking at solutions, uh, and against the backdrop of what Carl was talking about, about the need for energy and the rise of energy in India and China and, and Africa, uh, you know, you can't overlook what happened at Fukushima. And there was, a, you know, you've avoided, Japan has avoided the massive pollution that exists in China right now that is choking their, their people and their infrastructure. Uh, and yet, it was a massive failure of, of the nuclear technologies. Uh, does that, in your mind, suggest that Fukushima has, has uh, in a sense, eliminated nuclear as an option? Uh, in Japan for this, and do you have to find new technologies? No, we have not really li limited. There was a strong commission and that would inspect how safety the next uh, pl uh, plants may be. So there are currently two, I believe, two or three pl plants, nuclear plants have been revived. But on the whole, there is a trend toward the elimination of nu nuclear plants in the future. Okay. Uh, um, you know, it's said that all politics are local and probably solutions are local as well. So I want to come back to you, Dale. Uh, take us through what the on the ground political problems were when you started this campaign. I mean, 
I can't imagine that many conservative right-wing Republicans, have I got it all right? Yeah, conservative right-wing Republicans in Texas would look at you and say, Dale, this is a great idea. But, it, but again, it, it yeah. goes back to the economic argument. When you, when you communicate to somebody you're going to be saving them 24% on the cost of electricity, right. it's a pocketbook issue that they, they like, and then the, the environmental benefits is a bonus to that. It was made easier, too, because we have our own city-owned utility. So we didn't have to, I mean, about 95% of the people have to use the city of Georgetown Electric. And so that made it pretty easy. And the argument is pretty easy, too, except for some of the extremists on the right side were like, you know, you're an Al Gore lover. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I said the other day, is he's probably done more to, to, to make the world a better place in one day than his critics have in their entire life. And this is coming from a Republican, you know. And, but I, that's the way I see it. I tell you, there's a couple things, a couple points. You know, the International Security Forum, can you imagine what the foreign policy of the United States would look like if we had energy to independence from foreign governments? I, I think our foreign policy would look completely different. Um, Georgetown, Texas is 30 miles north of Austin and 50 miles north of us is Fort Hood. Fort Hood is the largest military army base in the United States. They have their own solar farm now. Okay, and if you look at the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard's also getting into solar as well. And I look at it from the long term, look 10,000 years from now, fossil fuels are a finite resource. In Texas, the wind and sun are gonna be shining and blowing probably 10,000 years from now. So I think people need to come to the realization that wind and solar are the future and fossil fuels are the past. And sometimes with these, these folks, because we had dinner last night with some folks that were in the fossil fuel industry, somebody needs to do an intervention because they're, they're not seeing the future. And I am, I'm seeing the future with solar panels and windmills. And it's, it's real, it's gonna happen in the United States because what's your, I'm a, I'm a CPA, right? So I pay for your wind turbines. What, say pay them off in 10 years, I get estimated use of life of 40 years. What's my cost of goods sold in year 11? Fossil fuels want to compete with me on cost of goods sold? I mean, I'll beat you every day because my cost is repairs and maintenance and maybe some rent. And you can also repurpose the land too because our windmills are up in the panhandle. And so you'll see cows grazing underneath the wind turbines and you can also see crops being grown. And so it, it's a very unintrusive way to produce energy. And if you look at the studies too, it also works out better in uh, weather catastrophes. It holds up better than your fossil fuel infrastructure as well. You know, I got to say, I don't know whether a conservative right-wing Republican hanging out with Al Gore is a sign of a bright new future or the sign of the apocalypse. It's one of the two. <laughs> I don't know which way it is. But Nicola, let me extend this now and, and, and let's go from that example that we've just heard. Uh, can you effectively make the argument within government that we should take the purely economic argument because I think what happens so often in climate change discussion is that at, at the high level we get very paralyzed with the big issues and how we're going to do it. Dale's on the ground and he says yeah, it's dead simple to do. Can we make that simply an economic argument and is that going to motivate the politics? Well I think, I think really it depends uh, on the country. Because we don't have the same political or economical arguments, I think, in the US, uh, in France, uh, in Sweden, in Germany, in Japan, in other countries. So not the same countries, I think. They're not the same countries with the same mindset. And so we don't have the same arguments to convince people. Having said that, I think that we are all committed just to make the economic argument real. Not only the economic arguments, of course, for the citizens, it means also for you, the elected people, for the mayors of the city, the, 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 the governors of the states, etc. But also making the economic argument real for the companies. And it works. I remember the reaction after President Trump announced that he, the US will withdraw uh, from the, 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 the Paris Agreement. Everyone said, well, does it really matter? Because most of the mayors of the city, the governors of the state in the US, mm -hmm. the big companies, the big business, say, well, we will still comply with the Paris Agreement. And in the field, really, it works. <laughs> Having said that, of course, there are other issues, which are, of course, the competence of the federal government in the US, also the competence of the government in other countries of the world. But I think that, coming back to your questions, I think that the economic argument is certainly part 
uh, of the arguments that we have to raise and we have to convince the people. But it's not the only one argument because you have other groups in the society who are more convinced by, I will say, the type, the, I will say, moralistic arguments or the political argument. And the economic argument is not exactly the same if we consider the short run and the long run because we have economic argument in both. In the short run, you have concrete consequences for you citizens, for you fellow citizens. But in the long run, you have also the cost of not fighting against climate change, which is huge for everyone, for the companies, for the citizens, for the states. But from this point of view, I think it's more difficult to understand. For, for, I think, to make the, the, the people sensible to this long-term economic argument. But I think we have to, we have to. And I think that's a fight that everyone has to, has to, has to launch. We, ha we must be engaged in the fight, each of the citizens. That's not a fight only for the mayors, not only a fight, as I said, for the, for the government. It's the fight for each citizen. And I think each citizen has to convince his or her neighbor. I think, for instance, let's say, in my apartment in Paris, you have some people in the apartment putting, you know, for instance, the, the, the glass bottle in the wrong basket. And, I, and, and of course, we are committed as citizens to say to the people who are putting the, the glass bottle to the, to the wrong bins, well, you have to, that's your responsibility to put it in the right bin. And I think that it begins like this. If you have some people in the street in Paris, and very unfortunately it happens, it doesn't happen in Sweden. Uh, that put, of course, you know, for instance, the, the, the packets of cigarettes, you know, they, they throw it, you know, in the street and not in the basket. Yeah. We have to say, well, Miss Sir or Madam, it's not just correct. Yeah, but and that's, that's why I was mentioning that the responsibility, it's a responsibility which is not, of course, a, which is a part of the economic argument. Because if you have, of course, to clean the streets, it costs money also. That's also part of the economic argument. Yeah, you see, you see this, this is one of the beautiful things about our strategy. We have 20 and 25 year fixed rate contracts. We're, we're by purchase power, same per kilowatt hour in year one as we are in year 25. So the benefits are really gonna kick in about year 10. But with President Trump, and the, I think it was a huge mistake for the US to unilaterally withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. It's interesting that that really doesn't impact the US until uh, after his first four years in office. And the way our strategy is, we have nullified the regulation of our federal government. What, are the, what is there to regulate with wind turbines that don't put anything in the air and solar panels that don't put anything in the air? So you can't regulate that. So what we have done is we've mitigated um, market volatility risk in the open market, and we've also mitigated environmental and regulatory risk because the state of Texas and the United States government, there's nothing to regulate with clean and sustainable green energy. And so, um, you know, we're sort of insulated from this re regulatory risk. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the strategy as well. Carl, can the, and I'm gonna to come to you for a second, but I'm interested in this, Carl. Can, you were talking about the need for more energy, especially in India and China, and ultimately in, uh, in Africa. And, the sort of negative view of that is that it's all going to be either coal-based or oil-based, perhaps gas-based in some cases. But can the Georgetown experience be applied to these countries that need massive amounts of energy in very short periods of time? Some of it can. I mean, no question about that. I mean, you can have sort of local communities doing things in a different way that they have been doing it before. But of course, there's a massive need for, as said, new energy capacity, electricity in these countries, at the same time as they need to go away from coal. So, so it's not a question of adding a couple of small things here and a wind turbine here and there. It's really massive things. As I said, energy infrastructure equivalent to the EU and equivalent to the US needs to be added there. And then the question is, is solar going to be available and that's a question of also the size of these particular things. Is it going to be available in sufficient quantities? The Chinese are doing nuclear big time, has to be said. Uh, the Indians are going nuclear as well. Uh, and with new technologies as well. Is that going to be sustainable? Remains to be seen. Is it going to be costly? Remains to be seen. Are there other technologies that can come? Biofuels of different sorts. Uh, we need to be very aggressive in helping them with the transformation and helping them to develop the new technologies. And without the new technologies that we are deploying in our countries, but 
we, it's easier in our cases. It won't work. And if it doesn't work in India and China, uh, then good with Texas and good with Sweden, but it's not going to help anyhow. Those are the big challenges. And further down the line, Africa. Doctor, you wanted to say something. Well, similar situation in, in Asia as well, um, like in Af Africa. Uh, the tropical area of Southeast Asia or South uh, Asia, India, the, uh, Pakistan, and then mm -hmm. uh, Thailand, uh, Philippines. So every year, huge typhoons so, uh, visit all places. Therefore, this does uh, create a lot of difficulties for poor, particularly poor people who are living on the side of the river uh, or near the ocean. Uh, the, so the excessive uh, this uh, 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 natural disaster does create even poverty. Therefore, we ought to be producing lots of uh, uh, way to control this, mitigate this uh, 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 climate change. As Mr. Bilt says, yes, we have to have a, have a new technology to control this. Uh, we have been putting so much effort for solar energy and wind energy, the, uh, waves energy and so forth, but this is not, not, not enough. So we have to use about electric uh, uh, the vehicles, cars, that would be also another way. Uh, to, yeah. It may be expensive at the moment to, when you buy it, but, and it may be troublesome to put the, the charge the car every now and then. Nonetheless, you use your car for so many years, like 20 years, 15 years. Yes. This will pay off, and the, the cost of the car will actually be more, uh, more economical. But you, but you know, the, this technology can be disruptive, especially in developing countries, sort of, say, if it was Africa. Remember, Africa just did away, they didn't even go through the landline telephone deal, it went straight to cell phones. So I'm thinking with energy, you don't go with landlines, you go with either solar panels or you know wind turbines and stuff. So it is that leapfrogging kind of technology that is the future. And you can, uh, for developing countries, they can really leapfrog into the 21st century. I think coming back to the yeah. competition, I think there is of course a huge competition about clean energy. And I think that's a right. real, I think it's a real challenge for most of the countries to be ahead of the others. You know, in the clean energy, I think uh, clean cars, uh, of course, uh, uh, energy efficiency houses and these sort of things. But I think there is another fight that we have to be aware of. Uh, and I made a report for my government some, some years ago about that, which is the fight for the norms and the fight for the standards. And I think it's something which is hidden, you know, in this, in this, uh, in this realm. We have a lot of countries trying to, uh, I think, the good practices praised by the international organizations, by the, the, the scientific groups, by the, the different panels, trying also to impose their own standards. Mm -hmm. And just, I just want to raise this question. And I think that we have to be very clear on that, that there must be also a sort of uh, neutrality in the ideal world, I must say, of the international organizations about that. Because some international organizations are really pushing, because you have some interference, you have some lobbying group, and they are pushing some specific technologies. And of course, I think that for, for, for the US could be also a problem, because if the US is out of the game. Of course, I, I'm not taking as a US citizen, I'm not a US citizen. <laughs> but I think, I think it's a very bad thing for the US, for their own, I think, competition assets. I'm going to uh, uh, throw it open to the floor, and I, I, I'm still, if I feel sort of a little off kilter, it's because, Dale, you, you, you're sort of shattering all my images mm. of what a conservative Texas Republican is, and yet you came back and said, <clears throat> Donald Trump's first four years in power, and I, I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> well, well, I just think it's interesting that he withdrew, knowing that it really didn't have any negative impact, or didn't have any impact yeah. until his first four years. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But everybody thinks, I've been doing a lot of international interviews, and, and folks think, because I'm a Republican, that me and Trump agree on all environmental and energy issues. We rarely agree in the, those areas, okay? He, during the campaign, he said, there's clean coal. There's no such thing as clean coal. Right. He said he's going to bring coal jobs back in the U.S. They're never coming back in the U.S. They're dead. There's about 30,000 coal miners right now. 
Those jobs need to be transitioned into the wind and solar energies. Texas is number one in wind production and number five in solar production, and, or vice versa, number one in, um, in um, um, wind, uh, no, number one in solar and number five in wind energy in the U.S., and that's going to improve. We'll be number one in five years. So we'll beat out California, so we'll be number one in wind and solar. And that's a, that's a resource in Texas that's, uh, it just goes out thousands and thousands of years unless we have this smog <laughs> covering up the U.S. and sunshine can't get in. And the other thing, too, that very touched on, you know, electrical cars and vehicles mm. and stuff. And you'll see that. I mean, Chevy just announced that they're going to have 20 different versions in the next five years. Volvo said they're not going to make any fossil fuel generated vehicles after 2025. Mm. And so you can see we're at a tipping point in my view right now. And this is the way the world is going, mm -hmm. and you're not you're not going to be able to compete if you're in the coal industry. And I know that's sort of hearsay here in Canada because uh, a lot of power is generated in Canada through coal. But that's not the future. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. I, Carl. Sorry. I, I, I want to. Lots of hands up here. So. Uh, oh, no, to, let me. <clears throat> yes, sir. Back there. I'm going to group a couple of questions in because I, I want to make sure that we get as many comments as possible. Keep it brief if you possibly could. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hideshi Tokuchi. Uh, I am a visiting professor of National Defense Academy of Japan. Uh, I have a question about uh, impact of climate change on marine environment. Mm. Last year in July, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague uh, made a ruling about the South China Sea uh, dispute between the Philippines and China, in which the court clearly ruled that China's land reclamation activities in the South China Sea is in violation of a Chinese uh, obligation under UNCLOS to protect marine environment. Uh, you know, the, uh, not only coral reefs, but also uh, giant clams and sea turtles are endangered. And, uh, you know, if you see the uh, satellite images of uh, artificial island on the South China Sea, you can see white silt running from uh, lagoons. It's a sign of dying corals. And, uh, but uh, the Chinese defy uh, that ruling. And one Chinese academic said, uh, the uh, dying corals are not, uh, the, dying, uh, the death of corals is not the result of land reclamation, but because of uh, climate change, global warming. Can you believe it? So uh, I'd like to have uh, a comment about that issue. Oh, okay, and sir, yes, we're gonna, just gonna bundle a few questions here. So this gentleman here. My name is JJ Omojua. Uh, I work with the Alpha Rich in Nigeria. So when the optimists and the pessimists were arguing about whether the cup was half full or half empty, there's the thirsty person whose cup is empty and just needs a cup. <laughs> Nigeria has five million metric tons in reserves of gas. Nigeria has substantial reserve in coal. Nigeria has big issues with energy. Now, how do you make the economic argument in that situation for renewable energy, considering these perspectives, considering the fact that whilst the argument is being made, because this argument in, in most parts of Africa, this argument is about people having a conversation about whether the cup is half full or half, or half empty, because as far as they are concerned, they just want power. They just want water in that cup. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what's the economic argument? We'll take uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, these so-called monster storms are happening with more severity and with more frequency. And uh, experts say that this is, Mr. Mayor, and perhaps this is for you, that experts are saying perhaps this is going to trigger two very worrisome phenomena. One is something called climate refugees or climate migrants, and we're already seeing massive uh, movement of people from Puerto Rico to the mainland. And the second one is possibly the bursting of the coastal property bubble. We can also already see, for example, in Miami, a lot of wealthy folks are having problems selling their homes when you get flooding on sunny days, things like that. So I'm wondering how you would evaluate the possible economic dislocation from those two things. Yeah, I'm going to stop there and try and just sort of recapitulate. I think the, the, the first question is along the lines of, where does all the best intentions of uh, environmental stewardship 
come into conflict with other national interest questions such as the South China Sea and uh, storms obviously being an issue in Nigeria being the case I think Carl that you were talking about right at the beginning that uh, when you're developing it means that you're poor and when you want to get rich you want to get rich as fast as you can mm -hmm. and you know you don't have much time for the niceties of solar you want to get right into it with coal and oil so th those are sort of the three biggest areas i think that i took away from the the questions who would like to start carl do you want to start well i can start with that and i can only agree uh i think success is going to be dependent upon price of the renewables coming down with new technologies uh, I think with wind, uh, debatable if that was going to happen more, because there's a lot of mechanics and things like that that require maintenance and things like that. So difficult to see the price coming down substantially there. Yeah. On, 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 on solar, it's coming down faster than one thought. And there is also the possibility for more localized production. I mean, you could do gigantic solar power stations, but primarily you can do a lot of local distributed, which fits Africa rather well. Um, so that's why I'm saying this is very much dependent upon prices coming down for the new technologies. Is there any possibility for doing clean coal at some point in time? Um, we have sort of fairly extensive programs in Europe to see if we can take the CO2 out of the emissions and store them underground. Um, that's perfectly doable. There are a couple of plants working in Europe that does that. But are they economic? No, they are not. Uh, they're roughly 30% more expensive at the moment. But is it absolutely inconceivable that we can sort that out? No, nothing is inconceivable. And we need to throw sort of research and development money into these things as well in order to help Africa, India, China. Those are the big issues. Anybody want to talk to the other two questions that were brought up? Uh, doctor, I mean, in, in, in the sense that you, you do peace and security, and with an attention to that part of the world and the question brought up by your colleague from Japan about the intractability sometimes of, you know, national interests colliding and the collateral damage is on the environment. Yeah. On the question of this uh, the coral reef and what's the cause of, of that coral reef dying, it's, it's debatable. Nonetheless, I understand. The, the question is, if the coral reef dies, fish which, who are living around the coral also die. And this will be the sharp, uh, the uh, serious reduction of uh, fish, which many people depend on. Uh, in that sense, coral reef uh, should be kept uh, alive, and uh, the efforts uh, not being done enough sufficiently by China, in that sense. Uh, I would say similar situations in other cases. Uh, the flood would uh, kill, uh, which uh, wash away the uh, banks of the river, uh, the beaches of, of the ocean, and this would also kill, reduces the uh, the catching of fish. In, uh, that would affect the. Uh, life of, of people there. So we, there, was a talk, talk, there was a talk about climate refugee, climate change refugees. That's one of those cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me well, take... Can I, can I tell, sure, uh, go ahead, Bill. With respect to the Africa question, um, I do believe it's possible to have localized um, solar farms there. And plus, there's a lot of women in Africa dying because they're cooking over stoves mm. that, are, that are putting out really carcinogenic kind of things. And that's senseless. We don't need that. Um, and the gentleman up there talked about pessimists and optimists. So, well, all the pessimists just need to step aside while all the optimists like us are getting <laughs> things done, okay, and don't give any more hindrances for us. Okay, we really don't need that. Um, I don't think uh, this clean coal thing, cleaning the coal and stuff, that's been talked about for 20 or 30 years, and we haven't, we haven't got the technology. In my world, there is no such thing as clean coal. Coal is a dinosaur. The future is wind and solar, and also hydro as well. In the, in the west coast of the United States, in Washington State and Oregon, they, they use hydro out there. You know, you run water downhill, cranks, run it back, recycle it, run it, run it up and down the hill, and it, it produces energy. And that's a future, too, because the world has a lot of water. And so um, 
That's just my random thoughts. Yeah. Well, that was good. Let me, let me take a grouping of uh, Scotty and the High Commissioner. And yes, ma'am. So Scotty first and the High Commissioner. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Scotty Greenwood. Uh, on the optimistic note, uh, one, Mr. Mayor, one of the technologies that we would be remiss if we didn't talk about sitting here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, is tidal energy, the power of the tides. And it's something that's been talked about for years, but the largest tides in the world are in the Bay of Fundy right here. Uh, the second largest are in the Bay of Bengal in India. And this year, there is breakthrough technology uh, that captures the power of the tides. And you know, the sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow, but you can set your watch to the tides. And so, I mean, maybe sometime next year, the local power company here, Amera, and the local legislature could host a field trip, and, and the world could really see how the power of the tides works, because that could help Japan and India and really any place there's water, which is quite a lot of places. Thanks. Mm. Thanks very much. High Commissioner. Thanks, Tom. Just uh, had a comment since uh, India was mentioned as one of the countries, uh, you know, which is critical to uh, climate change. Uh, India is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, and I'll just give you a few statistics. Uh, we have committed to establishing 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2022. Uh, upping it from 57 gigawatts at the moment. In the Paris Agreement, we agreed that by 2030, 40% of our electricity will be generated from non-fossil fuel sources. We are on track to achieve that by 2022, eight years ahead of schedule. We are selling 600,000 LED bulbs per day. And by 2019, the government has declared that only LED bulbs will be sold in India. We are the only country that I know of which has declared that by 2030, all cars sold in India will only be electric cars. Even Sweden, I believe, has a target of 2040. But we have said by 2030, all cars sold will be only electric cars. And most importantly, the price of solar in the last auction, which was held in August 2017, has dropped to 3.4 cents, American cents, per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. It's 20% cheaper than thermal now. Mm -hmm. So now solar will be very much part of the grid. And I think that's, uh, that's what gives optimism that India can uh, step in the breach, uh, which has been vacated by some other countries. Yeah, I think in the I'd, next five years, India is going to be the shining star in the world on what you can do in your country. I really do. The, the lady had a comment too. Just, no, no, she did. But I'm this, Heather Hurlbert no, from on, New America. On, just and I, hang, hang, hang on, on a second. second. Just while it's on my, when you get old, you forget things, so you got to say them when you think <laughs> of them. But battery technology, battery technology, the storage component. Mm. is the next breakthrough when it comes to renewable energies. If you can go on and take energy that is generated with wind and sunshine today and store it overnight and put it back on the grid tomorrow morning, that's going to revolutionize, revolutionize everything. I'm sorry. Can I, just before you start, can I just go off grid here for a second and point out the High Commissioner from India, who you've just heard, is the author of Slumdog Millionaire. True story. Aww. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> hey? Sorry, now, yeah. So I'm Heather Hurlbert from New America in Washington. I promise I actually have a question for the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, by now, many of you may have got the idea that not only is the mayor the future of energy efficiency, he's also perhaps a little what the face of the future of American politics looks like. Mm -hmm. And if part of what that means is that he's not just a one-off, but he's at the crest of a trend of American conservatives who are very interested in renewable energy, very interested in affordable energy, and as you heard him say, not so interested in regulation, not so interested in what our French colleague referred to as norms and standards, and maybe not so interested in the edifice of global adaptation finance that the international climate community has spent decades developing, what I want to ask our non-American panelist is what does that look like for the future of global climate cooperation? If the U.S. comes back to the table and says because lo states and localities have been meeting something like 30 percent of the U.S. commitment without any federal engagement whatsoever, we're back, we want to engage, but our engagement's going to look like 100, 200 Mayor Rosses across the country cutting emissions and not like the sort of commitment to the COP principles and norms that we saw over decades, how's the international community going to respond to that? So a non-regulated solution to the problem. 
Well, I, I think it's not regulated solution is not a solution, obviously, because you know the, the real the real problem is that you know the fight against climate change is not the fight against climate change in one country for one country. It's a fight in one country for each other country. So I think that we cannot understand because there is a sort of global planet. We don't have planet B, etc. It's obvious that the consequences of what the people could do in the U.S. or in other any country has the consequences in all other countries. So I think that from this point of view, I think that one country like the US cannot abstain to, to be uh, in the common set of, of regulations uh, that uh, have an impact worldwide. And that's also some, some of the fears that we have also in Europe with the Brexit. Because we think that if the, 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 the UK Effectively, I don't know if they finally, at the end of the day, will leave or not. That's another story. But uh, if the UK is leaving, uh, it could uh, abstain for uh, implementing the, the regulations which are part of the EU regulations. And also, the EU, the EU is trying to, 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 to have the UK back in the, in, the, in the game, especially on social and environmental uh, regulations. Then I think that the, 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 the problem is that there are also other damages to environments that, cannot, that can be only preserved by regulations mm -hmm. and not by economic. For instance, when it comes to the pollution of the, of the, of the rivers, uh, the pollution of the soils, uh, the fight uh, uh, against uh, 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 against uh, G GMO, uh, and all these sort of things, it's all about regulations. And the the, the problem is that the the the, the Paris agreements, uh, even from this point of view, is still not covering all the instruments, and still insufficient. Because even also, as I have to to remind that that if the Paris agreement is implemented, it won't prevent the temperature to rise uh, from two degrees uh, until the end of, uh, of the century. Uh, so I think we have to go also uh, further, we have to go deeper, and we have to, 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 to implement some measures that are not in the Paris Agreement too. So I think that's also something that we have to, to, to be aware of. Carl and then doctor, yeah. I would say briefly that if the United States beat their commitment in the one way or the other, that's for the United States to decide. I mean, the different countries do it in different ways. I mean, the Paris Agreement doesn't say that if you have nuclear, you should have that. I mean, do it whichever way you want, but do it. Uh, so from that point of view, okay. But then, of course, there's a question of the technology transfer and to certainly then the capital transfer in order to help say India or China or Nigeria somewhat. And there I think it is a question of sort of global solidarity from those of us who have been developing in a dirty way for 200 years to perhaps help those that are now catching up. Um, so, yep, you can do it in your unregulated way if you want to do it, fine, with me. Uh, but you need to be there, both the research and development side for the new technologies and helping the solidarity element with, say, India, China, and Nigeria to take those countries. Dr. Nishahari, you want oh. to? Well, basically, it's the same. If you can do things without regulation, that's fine. But today, when you want to save energy, you want to introduce a device, you need some kind of regulations or law that would force people to start using those. Once they start using it, then if they find the beneficial part of it, particularly if it's economical, then they would uh, start using this, and then we don't need really regulations. Uh, but I think we do need the regulations at the beginning. Okay, I'm gonna group a, a, another three. So, uh, ma'am, and the gentleman beside you, and you, sir. My name is Kate White, and I'm with the United Nations uh, Association in Canada. Thank mm. you uh, very much for this uh, interesting talk. Um, since it's a security conference, and we are part of my role is as a youth-serving organization, I will tell you, based on polling and our work with young people in Canada, that there is quite a sense of despair and dystopia about their governments, and certainly we, we engage with international young people as well, that somehow 
people aren't acting quickly enough on issues related to climate change. And I'm thinking about both in Africa, in the Middle East, and other places where we do have to both act and engage young people in making those larger decisions because they're willing to make uh, changes in behavior and they're saying, seeing institutionally we are not. And I wonder if uh, any of you have given some thought to that, both what it looks like globally and what it looks like in your own countries. Thanks very much. If you could just pass the microphone behind you. There you go. Hi, I'm uh, Walter Mead from Bard College and, and Hudson Institute. Just sort of I spent a lot of time studying U.S. politics, and it seems to me more likely than not that the U.S. will never pay its share of the climate finance, mm -hmm. that, uh, which is you know, roughly $34 billion, although there are lots of ways to count it, but as a percentage of, of wealthy countries. Um, what does it do to the global climate movement if people, if, if this just begins to look more and more like just an ir, you know, unmovable fact that that money won't be coming for, won't be forthcoming. Thank you, sir. And then we're going to take one last comment here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Lincoln Bloomfield, a policy guy from Washington, but I spend half my time in the private sector, a lot of it with innovators in the renewable space. So I would say that the people who are actually trying to develop and put technologies in the field have no resentment or are not cheating on the global movement at all. They, they applaud it, and there many of them are involved in it. From the, from the sort of the flip side, the, I want to just say a word about the barriers to entry. What, uh, what Georgetown, Texas did was a little bit more possible because you controlled the utility and you were able to buy the stuff. And the problem that the innovators face is that someone has to buy it. You know, you have to beta test it, you have to test it against the incumbent energy, you have to validate it. And this is all going on inside the U.S. military, the Canadian military, it's going on within UNHCR, the UN, but they're still stuck in the past. And, and so the question is, how do you adopt the technologies? And I just want to raise a couple of points. One is the storage, very important. You really should talk about the improving density of battery technology, the different chemistries, the stabilities, because hybrid power is really the solution. You're talking about 24-7 power that runs water, wastewater, everything that a village or an off-grid site needs. Uh, beyond that, you know, you, you need to have finance. And so what you did was the 25-year contract. People have power already in North America. You're asking them to buy a different set of power. They've already got power. So where's my money going to come from? This is the breakthrough, is to have uh, an improved kind of power purchase agreement where you sell energy as a service. And private equity is waiting to come in behind that. So when you go to Walter's point around the world, you come to Africa, to Nigeria, it's not a question of the US government writing a huge aid check to Nigeria or to organizations. It's really a case of entrepreneurs coming in with Nigerian partners and saying, OK, this is what we need here, here, and here. We just need a good bill payer. If someone can validate 10, 25 years of payment, private equity from Europe, from America, from the European Union will come in behind it. They just need some insurance like OPIC, some kind of guarantee that the bill will be paid. So I think there are ways to unlock this. The final point is that the, what do you do about the incumbents? Your utility was cooperative because you owned it. Many, many utilities in America are, are near bankruptcy. They have huge debt on their books. They're they talk about this as uh, grid defection, right? Uh, you have to overcome that problem. The utilities may have to either own the new technology or become a stakeholder, and that's, that's a big regulatory problem. When you do those things, uh, the path is clear. One more on recycling. There are companies Quickly. now that say everything you throw out can go into one bin, and there are ways of sorting it into 16 fundable streams, including organics, glass, metals, rare earths. So that technology is coming to, you don't need the bins anymore in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, and just before I go to the panel to deal with these things, uh, <clears throat> I'd be remiss if I didn't take advantage of the fact that we have one of the world's foremost historians with us. Uh, Margaret <laughs> McMillan is sitting here. <clears throat> Margaret, and, and if you could give me a brief answer on this, but your whole work has been around uh, chronicling the clash sometimes of national interests and how that's played out on the historical stage. And that's, that's been your life's work. When you take a look at this, because we haven't faced this in history before, this notion of uh, having to align national interests over something as weird as weather, uh, would, do you, are you optimistic 
that nations could do that? Well, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Um, yes, I am, because it, it, it often takes a catastrophe. Uh, the catastrophe of the First World War made not just the leaders of nations, but pe pe people. I mean, it has to be something supported by the citizens. If it's not a grassroots thing, it's not going to last. If it's imposed from the top down, I think it just won't last. And I think the catastrophe of the First World War made people around the world look for a new way to manage international relations. Now, the League of Nations didn't succeed completely, but it was a very important breakthrough. And I think the Second World War did the same thing. It made many people realize, and they, they pushed their, their leaders, and their leaders pushed them, that, yes, we cannot go on doing this. And I think there is now so much evidence of climate change that I think there is an understanding that we're all in it together and that we really need something major. I mean, you know, th there are huge problems in developing countries, but when you get smog closing down Beijing and people not wanting to live there, when you get Delhi completely unlivable at certain times of the year, then it brings it home to everyone. So I am optimistic. I mean, we're not fools. And I think we recognize that if we want our children and our grandchildren and their children to have a livable world, we all have to do something. So I am optimistic. And when I hear about the initiatives, you know, this, this is very encouraging. It seems to me there's an awful lot going on. And we tend to look at the headlines. We look at the United States pulling out of the Paris agreements. But so much is going on, it, it seems to me unstoppable. Thanks so much, Margaret. Let me turn back to the, uh, the, the panel. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I basically agree with you. I think it's unstop unstoppable. But, you know, if it's just not stopped now, the consequences are still there. And the consequences are just absolutely catastrophic. That we may, may must be aware of. And I think when it comes also to, we were mentioning, you know, Walter was mentioning the, the, the question of the, of the bill and the $33 billion uh, bill that probably the U.S. won't pay. But, of course, I agree with you. I think that, you know, you have a lot of private solutions that could really, I think, solve this real issue. We will have the money. We will get the money. Uh, and I think that's quite important. We still don't know if, at the end of the day, finally the US will effectively will grow for, for, from the Paris Agreement, because it will happen in 2020. And in 2020, something could happen also. Uh, we must be aware of that. Uh, I don't want to be, I think, exaggeratedly optimistic, but I think it could some, some, some of, the, of the issue. Last thing, very briefly, I think that also I think the citizens in many countries of the world are aware of the consequences for their life, of the life of their children, etc., of, the, of, the, of the, the, the quality, of the bad quality of the air, of the soil, of the water, etc. And that's also a factor of, I will say, democratic consciousness or democratic awareness. Let's take China, for instance. China, I think, is just trying to push also a democratic mindset and democratic, not revolution, but democratic, I will say, upheavals in China, also in India, etc. Right. And that's also uh, something that could uh, uh, make us really optimistic. Carl, final thoughts? Well, I mean, on, on the historical perspective, first said, we've had climate change before. The weather has not been identical. I mean, Greenland is not called Greenland because the Vikings were colorblind. Uh, <laughs> but it's called Greenland because it was much greener in those particular days. It was warmer during the Viking ages. Mm -hmm. And then we went through a period when it was very cold. Uh, the southern parts of Sweden are Swedish because the Swedish armies could march over the ice in those days and conquer Denmark. Uh, so climate has had an effect. What is happening now is, of course, we're talking about climate change of much greater size and according to consequences. I think things are happening. I think it will be very negative if the US is completely out of the solidarity aspect of it. And the solidarity aspect isn't just solidarity from the European point of view, helping the other countries, sort of India, Nigeria to take those two, is because it's in our interest. We will be affected by the negative consequences if this transition can't happen in an orderly way. But then, uh, final point really, I'm, a bit, I'm an optimist. I believe in technology. I believe in markets. And, and things are happening to a certain extent faster than we thought. A very interesting thing that happened the other day. I mean, I had to read the newspapers twice to understand it. Uh, Norway, another neighbor, um, lives not only of salmon, but also of oil and gas, as you know. Mm -hmm. They have built up the largest sovereign wealth fund of the world. They have sort of a trillion dollars or whatever. If I remember the figures, 1.6% of everything in the world is owned by the Norwegians. 
let that sink in. <laughs> but the, um, the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund wrote to the finance ministry of Norway mm -hmm. and said, we no longer want to invest in, we want to have new guidance so that we don't invest in oil and gas any longer. And that wasn't done because they sort of morally don't like oil and gas. That would be slightly difficult in Norway, by the way. Uh, but it was, they said, when we look at the economies, uh, the return on capital in oil and gas is going to go down because demand is going to go down. So the interest of preserving the wealth of Norway, we don't want to invest in oil and gas any longer. And that's as powerful a signal as I've seen for a very long time of both technology and market shifting without regulation, you might say, independent of Paris, but under that heading that is uh, this. So you can be optimistic in spite of the magnitude of the challenge that is there. Dr. Nishohar. I'm not sure whether I should be optimistic or pessimistic. Anyway, if we have a new technology to introduce to, uh, to save the, uh, 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 reduce the gas emissions, yes, it costs much. But once it's done, it will become much, much more economical. So I would say if the US is negative about providing the financial assistance to those countries that need really uh, money to improve their technology, that's very unfortunate. But other countries which are rich enough can also share each other and helping those uh, countries that need that, those technologies. Uh, we can hope we can manage it without the U.S., if that's the case. I'm going to give the final word to well, the mayor. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that the, the U.S. can be a facilitator on, and, and opening capital markets to countries in need, and also, and our historian, Margaret, um, you know, I, I did a, I did a, the German version of 60 Minutes about a month ago, and I'm still getting emails every day, and these are from young people saying that they believe that the current generation owes them a better future with a clean environment. And I think we need, I think it's our obligation to leave the world and the planet in a better place than we found it for our kids and grandkids and so forth. I'm optimistic. I think that's happening. And I think it'll continue to happen too. Terrific. Uh, on your behalf, uh, there's a few people I want to thank. Uh, Carl Belt, always amazing to have you on a conversation. Dr. Masashi Nishahara, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> the mayor of Georgetown, Texas. Uh, I don't know when your term's up, but I would guess everybody here who comes from a city would probably want you to become their mayor as well. So Three more years. <laughs> <laughs> four, more, <laughs> four more years. Oh, you're running for president. Okay. <laughs> I figured that out. And Nicola Tenzer, thank you uh, so much uh, for a great conversation. And just let me add in, too, uh, my thanks to everybody wearing a white lanyard, the uh, volunteers who have done such a magnificent job. Yeah, absolutely. Job. And obviously to all of you, this has been a terrific conversation and what a great way to end the Halifax Forum. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Usually it's you. Thank you, Tom. Oh. <laughs> I want to thank you, Tom, um, and I want to thank all of the moderators, um, and I want to thank all. I want to thank this panel, and I want to thank all of the panelists. I think some of the discussions that we had at Halifax this year were some of the best conversations we've had in ever at Halifax, and it's nine years of a lot of smart people talking, and so uh, I'm really appreciative of everybody. Um, we announced uh, four new programs at uh, Halifax International Security Forum this weekend. Um, we announced the Peace with Women Fellowship yesterday. We announced the John McCain Prize for Courage in Public Service. And um, we launched our podcast, Pete and Steve's The World. It is available on iTunes. And Google Play, of course, it's available on Google Play. And um, it's on our website as well. And it's an effort to make the issues that were discussed this weekend at a very high level more accessible to folks who don't follow these issues as close to, as close as all, all of the experts uh, who come to Halifax do. And um, today, right now, 
uh, I'm, uh, I'm announcing that the Halifax International Security Forum is actually going on the road, and we are creating the Halifax Chats series. Um, they will be a co conversations beginning in Washington, D.C., uh, one in February, March, April, and May, in cooperation with the Wilson Center, and we look forward to those conversations as well. Um, Tom already thanked the folks with the white lanyards. Those are our volunteers from the community in Halifax. And um, although Tom thanked them, I do think that it's worthwhile to thank them one more time because they did such a fantastic job. <laughs> um, and finally, I want to thank all of you. Um, we have 80 countries represented at Halifax International Security Forum this year. Some of them are an hour's flight away, and some, of, some people who came to Halifax spend more time getting here and going home than they do in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the truth of the matter is, and it's self-evident, we couldn't do this without you. So I want to thank all of you, and we look forward to having you back. More great conversations. We, like Professor McMillan said, Mayor Ross said, the world's only getting better and um, at our 10th anniversary next year. Thanks so much and travel safely home. Thank you. <laughs>